No, because the book we want to talk about is Barbarians at the Gate. And it's not just because it is really probably one of the best business books about greed ever, but because you personally met the chief villain of the piece, Ross Johnson. Tell us about this legend of greed. Well, I mean, look, it's a ripping good yarn, Barbarians at the Gate. I don't read a lot of business books. I, I mainly read novels. But the leading protagonist, who was the head of a massive US company called RJR Nabisco was a man called Ross Johnson, who uh, was probably one of the great examples of corporate greed that ever existed. Just to give you one little fact, he had in his company, well, he wasn't his company, he was just the head of it, 16 private aircraft and 61 pilots who were running what was then called the RJR Air Force. He was really fantastic, and I happened to have lunch with him in New York, and it took me three days to get over the lunch. I was in a bathosphere, you know, getting, <laughs> getting revitalised, because this man was legendary. His lusts and his greed were beyond <laughs> anything that anyone could even think of. Who paid? Oh, Christ. Well, no, <laughs> no doubt the shareholders. And that, and, and that, well, that was the issue, you see. The shareholders were paying for his lifestyle. Yeah, they were paying for everything. The thing is that that book, in, really in lots of ways, was the, was the foundation stone of all, you know, all the Michael Lewis's, the Liars Pokers, the, all the things right up to... I'm interested, you came into... Um, business in the two, 2000s, really. Yeah. So all this was kind of history for you. Did you read these books? Did you did you know about that kind of classic time of greed, the 80s and 90s? No, I didn't. But um, a few years earlier, say another 10 years earlier, I worked on um, boats in the south of France, and you saw the you saw these big, you know, whose boat's, my, my boat's bigger than your boat type thing. And there was, you know, Bond's boat there with the four X's and then there was this chic there and, and it was just pure decadence. And so it was sort of, uh, so that was sort of where the, where you sort of went the, whoa, yes. you know, what it, but sort of starting, you know, God, no, my head was still worrying about, you know, paying the rent and really working out what the profit and loss was. If, if <laughs> Barbarians at the Gate was, you know, there were many great books of that, of that uh, Wall Street era, but that was probably the great non-fiction. Probably the great fiction book was Tom Wolfe's Bonfire. Now, that's a favourite of yours, yeah? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think that was the first time we saw this kind of excess, this kind of character uh, in a contemporary uh, novel now. It's in the 80s now, and Sherman McCoy was, you know, masters of one of the masters of the universe. They called themselves, you know, the Bond traders with their red braces and their, you know... Uh, doing these massive deals. When you read it now and they're, you know, scoring bonuses of $100,000, <laughs> it just looks, uh, you know, uh, slightly sort of uh, dated or at least uh, eaten away by inflation, shall we say, you know. But certainly that idea of uh, someone who's entirely driven by, um, by this desire for material acquisition and everything is cast in that light and he's right at the centre of this book. Uh, there are other vanities which go on to that particular bonfire but the story of Sherman McCoy, because, of course, he's also hoist on his own petard. It used to be that the kinds of characters um, who embodied greed um, ended up badly. They, they, well, they do in fiction. So that's why it's called fiction. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other great one he, uh, Tom Wolfe did, too, was A Man in, a man in Full, uh, which I think is even a, even a better book about greed. It's but a But the terrific... difference with Man in Full, my recollection, I haven't read it for a while, but my recollection was that he didn't know he was a crook. I mean, he didn't actually go out to sell rubbery stuff and fake stuff. He just got caught. Wasn't that right? Well, yeah, he, he got into serious debt. But, but in my experience, a lot of these, uh, particularly in the corporate world, a lot of, of the very greedy people who take the hundreds of millions of dollars and so on are always able to rationalise mm. in their own minds that they were doing nothing wrong. And certainly Ross Johnson, the barbarians at the gate man, no, he wasn't doing anything wrong. 
He had built this company. He, he was entitled to have 16 aircraft and 61 pilots and a few hundred million dollars. I think they also justify it with this trickle-down effect that somehow if they're successful, other people will be down under them, which is, of course never ever happens, really. They're the ones who benefit. But, but that's how they justify it as well. As, well, I'm helping you know, the people I'm employing or I'm helping, I'm paying taxes and things like that. And, and isn't it funny how all there's a whole other sort of separate stream of publishing, which is self-help books, the mm, sort of yeah. how to become a millionaire. It never says rip people off, buy 16 yeah, jets, yeah. have 81 right. pilots. Yeah. Mm. It says, you know, work hard. Yes. <laughs> Do you... Or it never says I got lucky. This, and mm. this always annoys me, because I think successful people want to think it's because of stuff they did, rather than sometimes simply being in the right yeah. place at the right time. But no one wants to admit just they're rich because of dumb luck. No. But, most, yeah. but most of them, though, are genuinely rich because of hard work and luck. Yes, but I think hard work is sort of the number one thing that sort of gets them sort of there. But you're right, you've got to have the right timing, it's the right, right. industry, the right product, yeah. all of those things. The right country, the right race, the right class. Yes. It's <laughs> also what you're used to. I'm sure that there are cultures who just look at our lives and are disgusted at kind of what they would think is greed in just the way we think it's normal. So it's, yeah. it's just whatever your standard mm. is, you then start to judge things yeah. according to that. You're right, it's perception of greed is more the point it, in in some respects and what people think and then but more than That's also, the I think, advertising's created that. We, we have so much more than we need to survive. But people actually think that we need this stuff and we, se we, we sell greed as need in advertising. Mm. And all of a sudden, you know, you need to buy this product to protect your children against germs. No, you don't. You could just use vinegar and water. So, so in a sense, people, <laughs> they don't see that, or we don't see that we're being greedy because we, like, we justify it as, well, I need this to protect my family. The thing oh, but I don't buy household cleaning um, materials out of greed. <laughs> oh, you know, That's I, not what I, I mean. Heard. I've got more bottles of Windex than I need. But, but, uh, <laughs> but, but in a sense, I, I think as a society, we, we accumulate far mm. more stuff. And if, if greed is, and the, one of the very early definitions of greed was stuff beyond what you need to survive, then in, mm. if that, if mm. we're going by that definition, we are all incredibly mm. greedy. Yeah, but then look, look at what's happening though. Because of that excess, we've got more problems with diabetes and obesity allergies. and allergies. <laughs> and, and so, yeah. really. It's... I would like at this point to invite Dee. To bring a book because it is actually one of the great books and it's on greed and it's a little fable about just these things, Jeanette. The lyrics. <laughs> you must Dr. all Zeus. have read it, and if you haven't read it, you must read it. Read it. What was so good about it was up until now, most literature that was about greed was about the protagonist and what greed did to him or her and the people around him. Whereas this is about a wealthy industrialist who sort of takes something beautiful and starts selling to people that they don't need and ends up destroying the environment. So it was like a precursor to sort of the Ben Elton Stark sort of things, that greed has a big impact on our environment. But it was well before all of those. It was sort of, I think, early 70s. Yeah. That raised a very interesting point, though, about what examples of greed do to other people. And when you get very rich people who then spend their money on the big boats or, you know, excess of one sort and another. Other people then want to do that. And in, in that Tom Wolfe book, yes, there's the, the, the Charlie Croker, the, the main protagonist, but his example of excess, you know, thousands of acre plantations and all this sort of business. Poor stable. Now, now a very humble banker who is just a functionary in one of the banks that's trying to recover the debt, he sees all this excess, which he's never seen before in his life, and he wants it. Why shouldn't I have a bit of that? And he now constructs in that novel a way to get some. He breaks the mm. law. And this, I think, I've seen this in corporate life. So you're yeah. saying it's like a contagious disease? It is. I think it is, yeah. So um, it's from in envy, really, brings greed. And which, if you look at sort no, of the old... No, we can't go to envy. Envy's okay, coming we'll go to, yeah. on another show. Yeah. But if you look at, at, at mm. old, uh, old, um, older literature about greed, say Crime and Punishment, or even mm. Gatsby, it's people who don't have much who aspire yeah. to more. So in a sense, it's an economic thing that really, until the 80s, it was poor people who suffered from greed as a sin because they were the ones who just wanted to get out of their god-awful lives and they saw people who were born with more and they just wanted to be there. We've, we've been there before, of course, with these particular scenarios. This, this idea of, you know, you deserve it and so on is, you know, is as old as capitalism. Uh, and uh, Anthony Trollope um, wrote um, The Way We Live Now, describing a world in the mid-1870s which is um, entirely recognisable. 
financial speculation. It's you know at, at its core, um, the, the the key character is a is a dodgy stock manipulator. I mean, it's got a. Um, uh, Lady Carberry, who writes trashy novels <laughs> um, to support her husband's um, gambling habit, you know. It's always been there, and I think what distinguishes greed, apart from just that general kind of desire to have stuff, which is an understandable, you know, which we all kind of share, the, the, thing, the thing that makes greed a, a, a vice or, or a sin is the, is the notion of sort of wanting to have it all. That, you know, you don't you don't just want to have the sumptuous dinners and so on, but you actually want to eat everyone else's helping as yeah. well. Mm. You know, so mm. so you know that if if greed takes on a human form, then you know it is grotesquely mm. obese and self-satisfied and smug, and everything it does, it does. You know, the the person believes they deserve it and they've done it through their own merits and so on. And that's what's mm. kind of repugnant to us. You were also, um, Jeff, you were talking about um, the, the Russian writer Gogol, who wrote a book yes. called Dead Souls. It's a very uh, strange book, but it is a remarkable sort of satirical uh, comment on, uh, on greedy behaviour, if you will. The, what I was going to ask, though, was that, I mean, Vanity Fair, which you said that you had really liked the Thackeray book, which is, of course, about greed and mm. indulgence. 1847, Dead Souls by Gogol, the one you love, 1842, Trollope, 1875. Coincidentally or not, with the rise of capitalism. So, my question is, are we condemned to greed as people who live in a capitalist system? I don't know if we're condemned. I think the word greed itself, going on, on your point, is there has to be a, a negative to, for, it, for the word to exist. Because if there wasn't a, the, the, the negative, then just wouldn't, you know, it has, to, it has to take from someone. But capitalists, I think you do. Because in actual fact, you look at corporations and corporations that are run morally and well, they do service the society. They do, you know, you do have to make money. You do have to grow. Every business is, every business owner in the world's job is to get bigger, the business has to get bigger. Because you're only going one way. You're going forward, you're going back. So is it wrong that I want as my business to be bigger than last year? Is that greedy? No. It's what I should be doing as a business owner. Are the banks greedy? No. Without those stabilities, look at what happened in America in 2007 when it started to all go south with all the banks. Hey, guess what was getting affected? All the people. So is it greed? No. It's actually what businesses should be doing. But that's when... But it's like when the balance and the, the pendulum gets out of whack and when people are genuinely being victims of people who actually do it deliberately. And it's a psychological thing because people play on people's wanting more. They play on that. We all as one look to <laughs> dig. Uh, yeah. but can I, there, there is this sort of, a lot of people think that greed is something since the, the um, money economy. And there's a guy, Richard Newhouse, or Nowhouse, who's written um, about, and it's called The History of Greed. And he traces it way, way back yeah. before then that it has existed through texts as far back as sort of 150 BC. But in terms of advertising and this need to get more, we have a very individualistic culture in Australia and America in which personal possessions play a huge part. In countries which have a more collectivistic culture, like Korea, advertising promotes things like in-group harmony and families and things mm. like that because they are motivated by different things. So greed mm. has always been there, but in certain cultures, particularly in ours, it is greater than other cultures. So you're saying it's not capitalism, it's it our is not interpretation capitalism. It, of is, it. it is human nature, I, I, I think, I, of greed. I, it is human I, nature. Look, I must defend uh, capitalism. I'm a capitalist. <laughs> I'm a businessman. <laughs> Uh, and uh, good companies do great things. Mm. And greed has, in the, di in the dictionary definition, the word excessive is there. Mm. So if there's excess, beyond reason, if, if, if people are taking things they're not entitled to or things that are unreasonable, and there are many examples of that, yeah, but capitalism itself, no. And, uh, the idea but, that... The... Jeff, the, it's the logic of the system. The, no. the logic of the system requires that, you know, this constant expansion. So the idea of sort of human agency and whether people have too much or too little is fundamentally 
um, just subsumed by, by, um, by the system that says, you know, there are two motivating factors for all human beings, greed and fear. You know, this is one of the things that we hear. It's part of the Tina argument. There is yeah. no alternative. This is the only possible social system we can have where people are driven either by fear or or, or greed, and one of the things they fear is not having any money. So, uh, now, do you I think it is endemic to the system, intrinsic to the system? I, it's absolutely intrinsic to the system. I mean, how could it how could it be otherwise? So, what you're really arguing for is redefining the word greed, so it's not so bad anymore. Um, when, when in no. fact, um, you know, I'm not making a judgment about greed. I'm, I'm simply saying that it's absolutely inherent to the system that you have the kinds of excesses that you talk about because it leads inexorably to monopoly. I mean, the, you know, when, once you have the maximum market share, that's 100%. So you have everything and everyone else has nothing. And that's the end game that everybody is working no, towards institutionally. Not, no, no. You, you would be right if you just took a completely uh, a free view of the free market. But even Adam Smith in The Wealth, Wealth of Nations, you know, the so-called, you know, the, the sort of textbook on, on, the, on the free market system, at no point ever said you should have an unre un unregulated market. So that the point you're getting to would only come about if you had no system of regulation applying. And of course, society, if you didn't have any laws and so on, mm -hmm. would probably unravel whatever system you had there. So, uh, so I we have this constant I, struggle all yes. the way through the history of capitalism yes. to bridle it, rein it in, yes. control it, yes. and so on. And because so you inherently, and so it's you a monstrous should. beast. No, no, every other system would be a monstrous beast too if it was unregulated. You know, but it's dictatorships a are terrible. Well, 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 no, but we're talking about. Well, we're is talk, no, well, we're talking about. Where, yeah. You know, they they have their compensations. There are people who have. You know, there were people in, in the Soviet Union who had very few personal possessions but had enormous amounts of power. Let so, me... you know, there's always some... Kind of, but we're talking about greed works in, in the money system. Where, you know, it's, a, it's an expression in, of the money. Greed works in every system let me if take, it's unregulated. Let me take that point just and take it more pointedly, which is I can see what, what Shane means. Is it, is it the, to put it another way, the price of the evolutionary ticket? Is well, this what, in fact, if we want to, if we want to have an appetite just not for money, but for improvement, for knowledge, for love, for art. Do we need to have a level of greed? Is that really the price we have to pay? But isn't, aren't we always about getting bigger, better somehow? Like, I, I look at myself and I go, my, my evolution of my life is about being a better person, my business better. Now, if I get a bit of business, I then employ more people. If I employ more people, like, it's kind of... So you sort but it of... doesn't work like that if you're a novelist, so it doesn't matter how good you are, <laughs> you can't employ anyone else, you can't delegate. So we're talking in different, you know, you're going right over my head, I'm oh, sorry. I, yeah. Anyway, uh, to come back to a book, because I don't think this is right to say that capitalism is the driving force. You know, if you look at a a great, great book like John Steinbeck's The Pearl, a little short novel. You know, just, yeah, I mean, just such a wonderful... It's not that this is the actually audio book. Not that, book. that is <laughs> not that book. So, so you know, a, a, a story about a little village where, you know, a dire pearl diver finds the great pearl and the fact of that wealth coming into that village creates upheaval the and greed. The world, it's it's got nothing it. to do with any grand system. It's got to do with a basic human uh, motivation and the fact that in that little community there wasn't any proper system for containing the behaviour. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's, that's the important element. Well, 